Iowa City is a unique community. This uniqueness is shaped by the people who contribute their ideas and their time and their energy to the life of Iowa City and the university. Welcome to a series of biographical interviews of special women and men who have affected this community. Their contributions have been valuable, their lives creative and full. What brought them here? Who influenced them? What contributions are they the most pleased about? These and other questions will be explored during this series of interviews entitled, Tell Me Your Story. My guest is the well-known Iowa City community leader, Clark Houghton. Mr. Houghton received his BA degree in 1944 and his law degree in 1949 from the University of Iowa. While at the university, he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa and Omicron Delta Kappa. Clark Houghton, fondly known as Bud, has helped and supported innumerable civic and university organizations throughout his long and distinguished career, from Hancher to Goodwill, the Mercy Hospital, Iowa Law School Foundation, the Iowa City Public Library Board, the Museum of Art, Friends of the University Library, Old Capital Restoration Committee, to name only a few. He has established an incredible record of generosity, both to the University of Iowa Regional Endowment 2000 campaign for the University of Iowa Foundation. Mr. Houghton has been president of the Chamber of Commerce and Rotary Club. He has served Mercy Hospital in a variety of leadership roles, the most recent being chair of the board of directors of Mercy Center. Mr. Houghton was awarded in 1976 the Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of Iowa and in 88, he received the Hancher Finkbein Medallion Award, which recognizes leadership, loyalty, and learning. And finally, in December 1990, the Iowa City Noon Rotary Club honored Clark Houghton with the presentation of its Outstanding Community Service Award. This award, which is not given annually, is given to recipients who exemplify the qualities of outstanding community leadership. Mr. Houghton is a family man, father of four grown children, and has 12 grandchildren. And besides his record of civic service, he has served as president and CEO of First National Bank from 1959 until 1990. Welcome, Bud, to tell me your story. Well, thanks, Ellen. It's great to be here. You were born in Red Oak, Iowa. Yes. Was your father a banker? My father was a banker. My grandfather was a banker, came to Red Oak in the 1870s. Uh, my brothers later on became bankers, so it's been a, a, an occupation for the Houghton family for a long time. What, where did your great-grandparents, did they come, came they from, immigrated? Came from North Bennington, Vermont, came all the way to Iowa, and came to Red Oak, Iowa, the brain capital of Iowa, we always call ourselves. Oh, the brain capital of Iowa. But you haven't heard, ever heard that well. No, I have not. In the heard. old days when they used to give every pupil test to all the high schools in Iowa, Red Oak would gear up for these, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, we would always win the brain championship. We'd come to Iowa City, take tests, we'd have the queen and king of the brain derby, and usually win most of the subjects. And so this... I brag about a lot, of, a lot about Red Oak, so forgive me. No, that's... It's a I, delightful little town of 6,000 people. 6,000 people. So here this brainy group of kids graduated from Red Oak, and, and you came to the University of Iowa and enrolled in business school? Were you in the business school? Well, I actually enrolled in the College of Economics, although I took an awful lot of pre-med courses mm -hmm. thinking that someday I might want to be a doctor, but that was never meant to be, and I'm glad it wasn't. But What was it like being on campus well, this right was before the war? This was 1940. Uh, I would say students were fairly conscientious, uh, certainly not compared to our wonderful students today or the seriousness of the students who came back after the war. But lots of my colleagues were here for a pretty good time. Uh, some of them didn't attend class as often as they should, but obviously when Pearl Harbor came along, it changed all of our lives very, very much, mm -hmm. and almost immediately we all took off for 
recruiting offices and signed up in whatever branch of the service we wanted to serve. In those days, there was no question about the cause, no question whether we were going to do it or not. We all just knew this is the thing we want to do and let's get on with it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk more about your experiences later in the interview. Uh, what was it like being on a busy street corner as a president of a bank in the early 60s when you were uh, taking over the bank? Well, actually, I took it over in 1950 and, uh, excuse me, 1959. It was a wonderful time to take over the bank. Everything was going well as far as I could tell. And our relationship with the students was particularly good because I felt strongly about the students. When I first came to the bank, they wouldn't even cash checks for students. They wouldn't trust them that much. And I don't blame my predecessors because those were very serious times in banking. My predecessors had just recovered from the Depression. They were concerned about losses. So I do, don't criticize them in any way. But it was fun to come to a bank where there were so many things that I could change for the better. Well, tell me some of those changes. Well, let's see how I can cover some of them. Uh, certainly some of the things I'm very proud of. We were one of the first banks in Iowa to be very involved in the student loan program. Uh, many, many banks did not come in until very, very late in the uh, particular program. Very proud of the fact that we had three women on our bank board, which is more than any other bank board in Iowa, I think. Sometimes I brag a little bit, and I may need to be corrected, but my last mm -hmm. checking turned out to be that we had three, three directors. Not as many as we should have, but we're on the way. Good. And one of my officers I'm most proud of is Mick Hammer because she was the first female installment loan officer in Iowa. Mm -hmm. and still can, is at the bank mm -hmm. and does a super job. Now, I have to be careful when you're asking me about banking because I don't want this to be a commercial. Okay. I'm very close to um, my other banker friends, Dick Summerwell, whom you know, and Fred Krause and the Credit Union, Ray Glass, Dwight Siegmiller. They're all good friends, all close friends, real competitors in the past, but I don't want to have this thing be strictly a commercial for First National. Well, absolutely not, You, but it was part of your story. You spent 40-some years at First National Bank. I want to get back to to you remember once we talked about that it was a pretty tough time being in business downtown during those riot years in the 60s. Well, those are very those were extremely unusual times. They're almost hard to recreate or even imagine. But for some reason or other during those those uh, days of demonstration, the students seemed to have it in for the bookstores and the banks. Mm -hmm. I never could figure out either one, whether they thought the banks were charging too much interest or the bookstores were charging too much for books. But anyway, <laughs> those kind of became their places of, uh, of concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, it involved all of us going down, guarding our property every night. Then a businessman in Iowa City came up with the idea that he thought that he and I could solve this whole thing. So he said, we're going to meet with all the student leaders. We'll meet in the basement floor of the Hotel Jefferson. We'll meet with them on a very secretive situation. Mm -hmm. Well, that was one of the uh, most trying experiences of my life because, as you know, I usually like to have a little bit of humor in my life. Mm -hmm. But I walked down into this room, or we walked down in this room, and here were all the student leaders, and I won't go over all their names because a lot of them have changed and believe in everything good at this particular time. But mm -hmm. to walk in there and see these 12 or 14 faces without cracking a smile, and I can still remember one person that toward the end of the evening saying, well now, you better go over to your bank tonight, Mr. Houghton, because we're going to burn it down. And as it turned out, they didn't even try to burn it down that night. But remember, they were threatening to burn Old Capitol. And in hindsight now, it's been kind of interesting because uh, obviously we didn't stop the demonstrations. I'm not sure the meetings accomplished anything but except to convince us of the seriousness of the whole thing. But lots of those people now have come back or came back to the bank while I was there and they were coming from Minneapolis or other places and they said, oh, hi, Mr. Houghton, how are you? And I'm, I'm in law school now and I believe in the system and I believe in the establishment. We're not <laughs> mad at banks. We're not mad at bookstores. And let's shake hands and these are great old days again. So hmm. very interesting but challenging days where people actually were very afraid to come downtown. They did not want to come downtown. They were scared to come downtown. People were sleeping with guns by their sides. People were retreating to some country home to be away from the danger of the whole thing. Hmm. Did you get windows broken in your bank? Well, we never got them broken. It was kind of a funny story. I shouldn't say funny, but we put some special glass in our window that was you couldn't break with rocks. And I can still be, remember being inside and hearing the students come down the street. And if, I shouldn't say students because there are other people involved mm -hmm. too. But they, were, they would throw rocks at the window and the thing wouldn't break, the, rock, the rocks would just bounce off, and I can still hear this one kid outside saying, well, I'll be gosh darn, what have they done now? And so in answer to your question, our windows were not broken, but 
Uh, they did <clears throat> try to break them, I think, on all the banks in the town at that time. What a change for downtown now when people are uh, coming downtown and using the downtown the way downtown should be. You must be very pleased to have seen the change with urban renewal and um, for your business and for you personally. Well, I think Iowa City, the downtown is extremely unique. I can't, <clears throat> this is bragging again, but I can't think of any other town in the United States exactly like it. I was on a committee appointed by the Chamber of Commerce, which was a committee to study urban renewal for a year, made up of, I think, approximately 20 people. This was somewhere around 1965. And we studied for a whole year, did all our homework, read all our material like you are so good on the library board doing, visit other towns that had urban renewal, and came back after a year's study and reported to the city council that even though we had hoped that this could all be done with private money, we would not have to involve the federal government, our conclusion that we reached was, and we made the recommendation to council, that we have to suggest and recommend strongly that we go with the federal government for our urban renewal program, and obviously that's the way it turned out. Now the whole thing, you're too young to remember any of this, but the whole thing turned out that it was, it divided the town, <coughs> divided the town very, very much. Uh, people were either for urban renewal or against it, and not just moderately, I mean really seriously. Mm -hmm and got to the point where some were not speaking to each other's, but it all ended well, and I, I guess that's all well it ends well. And I, at this particular point, I'd just like to point out Lauren Hickerson's name, because I give Lauren more credit than any other one individual for the success of Urban Renewal downtown. He, he stuck his neck out when it needed to be. He was strong in his convictions. He believed in it, and uh, when we want to look back and remember some of the real leaders in the Urban Renewal, we ought to remember Lauren's name. Good. That's a good suggestion about him. Many colleagues and friends tell me that whenever there was a major effort with the university or the town, you somehow were involved in giving so much of your time and energy. Of all the things that you've contributed to this community uh, in your, from goodwill to mercy, is there some contribution you, looking back, you're the most pleased about, Bud? Well, the Iowa, the most recent one's the Iowa Endowment 2000, which I co-chaired with Dottie Ray. And I thought the response of the people in the three-county area to come up with almost $20 million for this particular program, for it to be something that's not for buildings, not for athletic contests, not for athletic buildings, Carver Arena, uh, was a remarkable feat. And the, uh, the, three, the three counties did respond. I, that, even though it's most recent, it's one of the ones I'm most proud of. I can certainly relate other things to the years that I've been very involved in that have been fun things and... Uh, I didn't know that you were involved in Little League. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, Little League, <laughs> at the very beginning, way back when, when <clears throat> at the very start of this, Iowa City people could not play, Iowa City youth could not play in Iowa City. They had to go to Coralville, even though they lived in Iowa City. And Coralville was very nice to let us play out there, not us, our children. Mm -hmm. And we thought this is great, but as people heard about this, they wanted to be inactive in it, so I was one of the founding members on the board of directors of Founded Little League, and we were very happy about it for the first few months, oh, this is great. And then it got to the point where the parents got so involved, there were no bleachers, and parents were right behind the fences, mm -hmm. and very much a part of, of the activity, and rooting for their own children, and almost booing the other children. And I can still remember the most explicit example of all this one night, one child was knocked down by a pitch ball. And these are young kids, keep in mind. I can still see this one woman, just like it was yesterday, standing behind the fence. Get up, you. You Get up, you. You're not hurt. And this was the emotional stage that it reached. And I thought, what is this monster that we've all created where parents are getting so involved? But today, as you know, and as Iowa City knows, it's a great program. They have bleachers now. Parents are removed. They still get very active emotionally, but they're more removed from the, mm -hmm. the fence where before they used to hang their fingers on. So... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Little League was one of my things that I was very involved in, and there are other people who have been recognized, too, for having a part in this. Mm -hmm. But I f meant to ask at the beginning of our talk, where did you, your full name is Hiram Clark Houghton. Mm -hmm. How did this nickname Bud come? You know, we don't quote that full name to too many people. Oh, okay. Because uh, I don't get any big thrill out of being called Hiram, but that was my dad's name, my grandfather's name. And my father was always crushed that we didn't name any of our children Hiram, but I couldn't wish that on him because every time I ever got called in school Hiram, I'd blush and please don't call me by that name. So somehow one of my brothers came up with the word Bud. Mm -hmm. 
my worst nickname was in, in Bud during the grade school, and we all had these with elephant ears. People, people thought I had big enough ears that I could fly, but I oh. overcame that either by getting a bigger head or something happened. But Bud became my nickname, but wherever I'd report in the Navy or wherever it was, it'd always be Hiram Houghton, or it'd usually be Hiram Houghton from Red Oak, Iowa. <laughs> they thought I was coming with Sounds a like a cheerleader. Oh, they thought I was coming with a pitchfork and a, and a bale of hay, so uh, that's where it all started. Siblings, you have, you mentioned a brother and you have a sister? I have two brothers and a sister, right. My brother lives in Washington, D.C. Another brother lives in Red Oak. My sister lives in Nashville, Tennessee. I was the youngest. But looking back, what person or persons had a major influence on your life? Well, certainly I should <coughs> name at the top of that list my parents and certainly my wife and children. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly outstanding teachers that I had in law school. Uh, ministers that I've been very close to. Catholic priests whom I've been close to. My two predecessors who were presidents of the bank before I was. I hope tried to pick up their good qualities and uh, continue them under my presidency. You've been lucky. Well, I was very lucky how I got the job because uh, after I enlisted in the Navy, and we'll talk about the Navy in a few minutes, but this happened to be at a dinner one night, and I was going to—I'd been hired by the Ford Motor, Ford Motor Company in Dearborn to be a lawyer for them. And this particular person said, "What are you going to do?" And I told him, and he said, "Why don't you come down tomorrow and talk to me about banking?" So this person's name was Frank Williams, and he wanted me to start helping him as quick as I could. I loved Iowa City, so I accepted the job, and unfortunately, he died two years later. So at that time, they decided correctly I was too young to be president of the bank. So. Mm -hmm. Being nice to me, they went to Chicago and said, don't you have somebody in the Continental Bank that's going to retire very soon that could come out to Iowa City, be our president, while, while I was learning the job. And so a person named Norm Schaefer, who loved Iowa City as much as I do, came out, trained me until I became president in 1959. So both of those gentlemen, they were complete contrast to each other, and I won't go into the mm -hmm. different characteristics, but they both taught me many things, and I hope I remembered the good ones. Your family, I know, means a great deal to you. You mentioned that they had a, had a major influence on you. You're, you have four children, Steve, Connie, Jim, and Kathy. Um, and your wife's name is Joan. Where are your children living? Any of live in Iowa? Well, our two I know Steve does. I know. Our two sons live in Iowa City. Steve's uh -huh. a tennis coach at the University mm -hmm. of Iowa and has four children. And our son Jim's a lawyer in with Cruz Barker Kennedy, that particular firm, and has been there for several years now and enjoys being a lawyer very much. Our two daughters, one lives in Salisbury, North Carolina, and the other lives in Northfield, Minnesota, where she teaches school, and her husband works for St. Olaf. So two of them are scattered around, but we get to see the grandchildren at least twice a year. And I hear when you get together, you're a big game-playing family that you, it might be ping-pong, charades. Is this a family tradition when you gather? Well, I think it's a, we used to say it was a tradition, even when we entertained people, knew when they came to our house, they were going to have to play games whether they wanted to or not. But <laughs> our typical vacation at Door County, which we love very much, is, is games. It's whether it happens to be tennis or trivia or password or I doubt it or our grandchildren love to play pig. And so we are a game family, and uh, people always say, what are you doing in Door County for three weeks? Well, we seem to, the time passes rapidly. How would you meet Joan? Well, that's hard to say because we were both met in we both <coughs> lived in Red Oak, and she lived a couple blocks away. Although she was two grades behind me in school, I guess we probably just always knew each other, but didn't actually uh, think very seriously about anything until we both gone away to college. Mm -hmm. I want to talk now about your Navy experience. Right after graduating college, you you joined the Navy and you found yourself as a 21-year-old landing craft ensign at the beginning, uh, a D-Day in, in 1944 in June. Can, let's talk about this part of your life. Well, it's a, <clears throat> obviously an interesting part of my life, and it's no more interesting than anybody else that served in the service for their country, but <clears throat> I did go into the Navy, and it was a very interesting program because when I, <clears throat> when I was called, we were sent to midshipman school at Notre Dame, where we were called 90-day wonders. We were supposed to learn everything in 90 days that the people in Annapolis learned in four years. And obviously this was not possible, but it was an extremely intensive course where we'd go to get up at 5 o'clock and <clears throat> go to bed at 10 o'clock. Hated to go to sleep because I knew I was going to wake up too quickly. And it was extremely concentrated, but they taught us navigation, seamanship, ordnance, everything we were supposed to know. 
came time for graduation and we all said, oh, we'd like to go on an aircraft carrier, we'd like to go on a destroyer, we'd like to do submarines. Well, they were building up for D-Day, so 95% of my class all went to landing craft. Mm -hmm. Picked up a ship at New York, trained on the Solomons, crossed the ocean. At a, ours was the smallest type of ship that crossed the ocean. It was only 150 feet long and a four-foot draft. No radar. It took us 21 days to cross the ocean. It was extremely rough. We all lived on 7-Up and Cokes and crackers <laughs> crossing the place. All lost weight, believe it or not, at that time. And uh, <coughs> landed in England in uh, 1944. Mm -hmm. in February and the war, of course the invasion was to come up on June 6th. Mm -hmm. uh, spent time training in England knowing that we were going to be involved in D-Day at Normandy. A week before the invasion and we all had our secret orders aboard, <clears throat> but a week before we picked up our 200 troops that we were to haul across the channel and to land them on Omaha Beach on Dog Red Beach. These were terrific people. They'd been training for two, for two years to be a very major part of this uh, landing. Keep in mind, I was on the ship and they went down the ramps. Mm -hmm. So my position was obviously much safer than theirs and I'm no hero at all, especially compared to what they did. But crossed the channel, uh, landed a little after H hour on Omaha Beach. Most of our army people were killed or wounded as soon as they landed. Nobody was hurt or, or killed on our ship. I wanted to get out of there, but they had to stand by and pick up wounded, which we do. And again, that was a very bad experience because we had no doctors aboard or anybody. So we just, we really couldn't help these gentlemen very much until we transferred them to a bigger ship. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that was D-Day and it was a very moving time in my life. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about it. I've been back several times. Yes, you've been back to Normandy six times. In I've been back six times to Normandy and actually nine times back to Cornwall in southern England, which is where my ship sailed out of all the time. And it's kind of a pilgrimage for me. Well, it's more than kind of, it is a pilgrimage. I go back there, go back to Cornwall to see English friends. The English people are so terrific. And the people my age loved us in World War II and they love us today. And it's very refreshing to go to a country where they say, I still love you, Mr. America. Mm -hmm. First few times they went back, they used a wonderful expression, oh, Mr. Houghton, you haven't altered a bit. <laughs> they changed that. They no longer say that. But anyway, they're still just as nice to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people in France, too, are very grateful for the, for the participation. Did you go alone the first time you, re you returned, or did well, Joan, you, you and Joan? Joan went? And I, Joan and I went back, and we relived, and I, we relived the whole thing, crossing the channel as I did, back to the cemetery, back to all the gun emplacements, which are still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an extremely moving time where I tried to take her every place where I'd been involved too. And since that time, we've taken all of our children back in different shifts, except one, and Connie, I hope, gets to go someday. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, it's moving to them, and you go into the cemetery, and it's hard to say that any cemetery can be beautiful, but it's, it is. It's done the way you would want it done. It's 10,000 white crosses done mm -hmm. beautifully with the landscape perfect. And as often as experienced, why well, I, I walk up and down there to see who I remember, what names I might come to my mind. Mm -hmm. In there's an exhibition hall in uh, this little town in France, Bierville. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And there's a letter in this uh, exhibition hall that you wrote to your parents in Red Oak on the eve of D-Day. Yes. I would l like, if you wouldn't mind, sharing. Um, I'm not going to read all of it, okay. <clears throat> Ellen, and I it isn't that great a letter, except it just kind of gives a couple of things which are very important to me. And uh, it's been reprinted, well, in that particular museum where you mentioned where it's been reprinted in all the different languages of people that come there, mm -hmm. and they read this in German or French or whatever it happens to be that where they're from. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to read it. I'm not a real good reader, but I'll just read very quickly a couple parts of it. I'm writing this on my return to England, and this is written at 8 o'clock on June 6, 1944. Uh, well, as you know, by reading, <coughs> I was under fire in the Sur 540, which was the number of my ship survived its first test. It was a horrible ordeal, but the best way I know to explain is to start from the beginning. beginning. We took, I'll look up now. We took sure. the Army about aboard, aboard about five days ahead of time and went up and hid in the little town of Foley, England, where we could not be bombed. And so for five days, we got to know all these gentlemen very, very well. We had to feed them, which was obviously very important, but also to get to know them. 
and uh, without exception they were a great group of men. We tried to make their trip aboard as pleasant as possible, got out all my Glenn Miller records and played Glenn Miller records for them, made donuts for them, uh, watched them gamble. They were all gambling more than they should have with their invasion money because they knew only probably a few of them were going to survive. But it was a very, very moving time, and uh, obviously we crossed the channel with them, and it was a very rough time, and several of them got seasick. We would promised them that we'd get them on the beach and that they would not get their feet wet, which miraculously we did do because lots of the LCIs had not made it, and people had drowned them in if they walked off the ladders. But uh, it's, it's left an imprint on my life and my family, and uh, the other part of the letter I'd like to read is, just down here, I'll just summarize. We headed in for the beach and all seemed relatively quiet. It was most gruesome to see floating dead bodies. We headed between two stakes, then all hell broke loose, mortars and guns fired on us. We got rid of our troops. But the last part I want to read is the last paragraph from the letter. And, you know, Irving Weber did an article on me several years ago on the 40th anniversary of D-Day. And I said, Irving, you can do do it if you don't make me out to be a hero. Because I said, I'm not any hero. There's millions that did more than I did in World War II. So, okay, Irving says, we'll try to do that. And he did do a good job, and I'm mm -hmm. proud of the way he did do it. But my last paragraph, it said, at this point, I'm naturally very happy about all of us being okay on the 540, but I keep thinking about the poor soldiers. We in the amphibious forces may face hell for a while, but how about the soldiers who have to face it for God knows how long? I came very close to all of them the week they were on here, and as they left right in the face of the enemy, tears came to my eyes. They are the real heroes of this war, the Buck Privates, the John Jones, the Red Oak. What they wouldn't have given to come off that beach with us, but they had no alternative. There was only one way for them to go. I'll take my hat off to a soldier for any time. Well, your worries are over, Mom and Dad. The worst part is over. Well, that was just partly too, because we crossed the channel in the next weeks and months 76 times with other, mm -hmm. other troops and other experiences. One of the most funny ones, just to make a little diversion here, Alan, was five days after D-Day, we came in to load our troops, and the person who was in charge of landing the ship at that time looked, and these were Army nurses. Well, we hadn't seen any American women for months, and this mm -hmm. was to be the first group of nurses to go to France. So. This is actually a true story. He was waving to all the nurses before they came aboard. As he was doing that, he forgot to stop the engines. We crashed right through the dock. The British made us pay for the dock. But anyway, it was a great experience for all our <laughs> sailors to cross the channel. And what wonderful women these all were. They again were prepared to, to die for their country if need be. And I'm sure many of them did. But I read a terrific article about you in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, it was a about the commemoration of D-Day 40 years later. I think it was called A Legacy of Gratitude. Um, you were a part of that commemoration that all, many countries took part. Just share briefly what that was like. Well, the 40th anniversary return is one of the most meaningful ones to me, and I went back a little bit early before June. So all the newspaper, pe newspaper people from all the country were very anxious to latch on to anybody any better than they could. Mm -hmm. Well, I was the only one around, I think, at that time, so they all latched on to me, Life Magazine and the uh, Los Angeles Times and newspapers and AP from all over the country. But again, I told the same story. You got the wrong guy. You should be talking to the Army people. But anyway, one of my last interviews, well, I had a great interview with Life Magazine, which never came out because they got the, the uh, interview too late back to the magazine that had already gone to press. But the very last interview I had was in the cemetery on which this picture appeared on the, the front of the Los Angeles Times. And this person, I didn't even know who he was, obviously, he casually visited with me, and I never gave it another thought until I came back to the United States, and long came the 6th of June, 7th of June, and here people are starting to call me from California that, hey, hey, bud, or Hiram, whatever they all call me, your picture's on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, and I thought, there's no way that can be, what's it for? No, you're here. Your your picture shown in the cemetery above Omaha Beach. Great picture of you. So, uh, I got more publicity out of that than I deserved. There were veterans from all over. I mean, the United States, uh, Germany, f France, uh, not b Germany. Excuse me, Britain and Canada didn't to come back to this celebration. They did come back to that celebration, mm -hmm. and uh, the particular day of the celebration itself is not all that meaningful. And that's why I went early because the day of the celebration is kind of turned over to the generals and the presidents of the country, and mm -hmm. they don't have too much time for some little ensign that served on Omaha Beach, so. So it's a wonderful story, bud. 
Um, I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I do want to ask you, you're retired. What's happening in your retirement? What do you enjoy doing? What Besides do I enjoy going doing? to Door County. <laughs> well, I enjoy lots of things. I, I was working 65 hours a week before I retired, as, as you know, and I, everybody thought I was working too hard to work on Saturdays and Sundays. So retirement was not without its challenges, but I've become very active in volunteer work. I'm doing volunteer work at uh, the three hospitals. I haven't started at Mercy, but I have a university and veterans mm -hmm. hospital. I'm going to start at Mercy next week. But the one I'm spending most of my time uh, doing volunteer work, calling on patients at the veterans hospital. And uh, it's probably wrong to say I thoroughly enjoy it, but I feel good after I'm over there because mm -hmm. most of these people are World War II veterans. And we visit and we joke, and they may be in pain, but we visit and joke. And I try to convince them the Navy won the war, and they try to convince me the Air Force or the Army won it. And, Almost without exception, by the time I leave, I think they're feeling better, and I go home after doing it for three hours, and I go home to Jones and say, I feel awful good today. Mm -hmm. I'm getting involved in organizations, again, civic, still act very active in the church. Um, You're playing a little tennis. Playing a little tennis, which mm -hmm. has its little challenges with my new hip that I got a few years ago, but mm -hmm. playing lots of fun recreation tennis. Traveling a little, I hear. Traveling quite a bit, not mm -hmm. as much as we probably are going to. Visiting the, some of our grandchildren who do not live here. Go to their little league games, their volleyball, their basketball games. And now I have a granddaughter playing basketball for City High. Believe it or not, well, I'm not going to brag at all. <laughs> I have a rule: you can't brag about your grandchildren for over th over 30 seconds. So we're not going to do any well, bragging on that. Well, there's the 30 seconds. But it's been terrific to have you as a guest. Well, it's been great being on here, and I uh, I've enjoyed it, Ellen. Thank you very much. My guest has been Bud Houghton, from Landing Craft Ensign on D-Day to Iowa Law School graduate, from bank president to president of Rotary and Chamber of Commerce, from fundraising for Goodwill, Mercy Hospital, University, Hancher, Art Museum, and many other civic and university organizations, to Omicron Delta Kappa's Father of the Year, from the Hancher Finkbein Medallion Award winner to the Rotary's Outstanding Community Service Award winner. Bud Houghton has been a generous Iowa City benefactor, giving of his time, his efforts, and his enthusiasm. He has been a true friend to both town and gown. This community and Iowa City, the university, are indeed fortunate and enriched that Bud Houghton chose Iowa City to be his home. <laughs>